I'm going to use that to market what I've done here. That's right. That's right. I don't want to stop this time. <laughs> cool. So, um, hi everyone. I think, you know, it's uh, for me a much easier job in some ways. I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking to all of you. I know you've been through a day long uh, set of sessions and you've still got more to do tonight and stuff for tomorrow. Uh, so, I'll try to keep the talk portion of this light and leave it open to more questions from you. Uh, because at the end of the day, what, is, what happens is product launches come in many different flavors, right? Depending on what the product is, what the company is, what the market is. So, there isn't a lot that I can prescriptively say, do this at your product launch. So, what I'm going to talk about is maybe a few patterns of good and bad product launches. Uh, I'll try to give some examples along the way. Uh, but questions from you about stuff that you are trying to do. In fact, uh, I understand that stuff like product labs, you probably got a product of your own that you're hoping to launch somewhere. Right. So if you're thinking about what makes a launch good or bad, it'd be great to get questions in chat. So to just get started, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Sharat. I currently work at Mintra. Uh, I'm senior VP of product management there and run all of our uh, digital consumer products. <laughs> Uh, over the course of my life, I've studied in a couple of places. MS University, Baroda, the same as uh, Tinkesh. We uh, probably overlapped but never knew each other there. Uh, I then was at Texas A&M. I've worked in a number of different domains at Google and ads and search, uh, at The Guardian and traditional media. Um, so the Guardian newspaper, for those of you who've seen it, is one of those big voices in investigative journalism, but amazing technology and amazing investment product as well. Uh, from there I went to something much newer, Twitter, which was kind of uh, social media. I was working on TweetDeck, uh, power user features across Twitter. Uh, so this is what happens when Justin Bieber tweets and his Twitter starts getting flooded. Uh, he doesn't get the same Twitter experience that we do uh, because he just wouldn't be able to keep up with replies, mentions. That tab is useless for him. So uh, all the power users, whether they're journalists, they're celebrities, um, they would have a very different experience. <clears throat> From there, I made a plunge into something that was very different in the world of e-commerce. And I started out with travel uh, e-commerce. You can't quite see the, uh, I think, house strip logo here that is behind TripAdvisor. Because I think I graded out to indicate that house strip doesn't exist anymore. It's not part of TripAdvisor. It got acquired. So there, I used to run product engineering and design, so I got to see a very different view of the world as well, trying to try and fight the product engineering battle and design battle in my head as opposed to being the product guy who could then go and fight the battle of the uh, And then most recently now at Mintra, I take care of product management at Mintra at So I guess when we start off, uh, if you were thinking just about the word launch, what comes to mind? Market. 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 Okay. Well, just getting Media. Getting, uh, getting uh, people know what it was. Rockets. <laughs> First thing they started launching, right? In fact, <clears throat> the reason I said that also is if you try and look at what does launch actually mean, it's actually hurling a missile. That, that was the original meaning for launch, right? And this, again, I think because I had to lose my laptop and use a different one, this is old French, Lancier, Anglo Norman French launcher and old English for lance or the, you know, uh, big spear. And that's where, as Middle English came around, launch became a word for hurling a missile with force. And you also see, interestingly, the reason why I said rocket is right about this point is when the uh, Apollo mission happened. And launches, because of the way NASA used that terminology and the media picked it up, it started showing up in books and if you plot product launches, somewhere around 60s, people start talking about product launch as a phrase. This is from the Google Ngram viewer, right? So you look at when this phrase starts showing up. And you start seeing that the word actually comes out of what people were doing in uh, space missions a lot. The reason why I brought this up, I'll come back to it towards the end of my talk. Uh, you also find in a lot of management uh, terminology, it actually originates in the military, right? So you think about strategy and tactics. We are actually specific military concepts. We have analogs for them in the business now. Um, and I think launch is one of those interesting things that has those military and space things. 
The other bit is many of us think about a launch and we think, you know, the product is there now, it's done. But if you actually think about the word, it's about the beginning. It says, you know, this is how you set it in motion. You launch a boat, you actually push it out of the water. You launch a product, you just pushed it out there. It's not done by any means. So, given that it's just the beginning, if you start recognizing that a good product launch has a lot more after it, you'll actually start thinking about what are all those things and how should I plan for it. Um, you spent a lot of time obviously getting to the point of launch. Maybe you started thinking about this problem a year ago, you spent time prototyping, researching, building, doing all of that, got to your launch. But actually your customer doesn't care about how hard it was to build, how long it took to build. They don't see how the sausage is made, and even if they did, like, what's it to them? That's not their business, right? Um, they don't really care that it took a year to build and therefore somehow this is a good product. But on the other hand, they do care about what it does for them. And it could have been built overnight, it could have been built by tons of effort, by one person, by many people. They would only care about it in terms of what does it do for me? And all of us are like that in our own lives as well, right? When we are building products, the companies we work in or the companies we are trying to start, we get very emotionally attached to them. But think about how easily we criticize a product feature from a different company. Like when someone criticizes a product feature that Mintra's launched, I take that very personally and very, very carefully and start thinking about, well, we built it with this intention, we did it with this intention, we didn't work with all of that. But let's say Swiggy screwed up an order. It would be very, very easy, even for me, who understands that market, who has friends at a fantastic company like Swiggy, to say, oh, they just screwed up. Right? And then later on, when you're reflecting on it as a product manager, you start thinking, I kind of get it. This wasn't just a simple screw up. There is a lot more that goes into building a product like that. It's not quite finished. In some ways, your program is done when the, when the product is launched. But your product, on the other hand, is just getting started. Uh, what this means is you still have to worry about things like uh, how am I going to measure it, how am I going to iterate, what am I going to do next, and so on. Now, for all of that, you really need to have some well-defined outcomes. Right? And outcomes, of course, yes, it's very easy to say my product will have a number of different outcomes. But figuring out which one is <coughs> So I'll give you one example that we we met through at Mintra <coughs> relatively recently. Right? So shortly after I joined, uh, my team relaunched the web products at Mintra. Some of you might remember at one point we famously shut them down and then we restarted them in the mid 2016. <coughs> so we first launched the desktop website, we said, you know, we said the mobile website and then the desktop website. And when we did that, uh, there were a lot of outcomes that we were interested in. Is this going to bring us new incremental customers, people that we've never seen before? Um, or existing customers, is this actually going to give them one more avenue so that when they don't have their primary phone with them, um, they have access to the web on their laptop or something else? Um, is this going to help me acquire customers who, for whatever reason, don't want to install an app, don't have enough space in the phone, but, and they want to conserve that space for something like videos, photos, etc. But now, which of these do I start caring about? Which means even before we started saying we'll go and build it, we had to define that. I said we're either going to go after this because we believe there are customers who are not being served by our current products. Or we say, hey, this is just going to open up an avenue for people who want to use our product on different devices. In our case, we went with the case of saying there are customers who are not being served by our current products. Which means everything that we measure from that point on has to be tied to. Right. And, and that's why I said well-defined outcomes. It's very, very easy to fall into the trap of saying, we've launched it and because this is an e-commerce website, let's look at conversion. Yeah, conversion's looking good, traffic's looking good, we're done. Whereas in reality, maybe all you're doing is you've shifted some revenue that you know, used to come in from on the apps. So I do. Right. The mobile web. You patted yourself on the back and gone home. Right. And we agonized a lot. And by the way, this is a very simplified description of this, but both before building it, during the building of it, and after as well. We agonized over everything that we discovered. Right? Like, cannibalization is very, very tough to say. Um, just because a customer who was spending money on the app also spent money on the web, it doesn't mean it's incremental. 
but it doesn't also automatically mean it's not infinite. How do we figure that out? Right? There is no simple analytical way to figure it out. But then you start saying, hey, I'm going to use some heuristics to measure them and say, uh, customers who've not been shopping with us regularly, if they've come back and shopped with them, maybe higher probability that it's new revenue or reactivation that we care about. Now again, this is not well defined enough because you're simply saying customers who haven't been shopping regularly. Where do you draw that threshold? People who haven't shopped in the last six months, in the last seven months, right? And so you have to go back and define each one of these carefully because once the launch happens, you're not going to have the time to go back and do all this thinking. This thinking is, and there's not just one person doing the thing, right? It's not like the product manager sitting somewhere in a room going, boom, 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 done. I've got all these answers. Here, everyone look at this report. Instead, you're going to go and make sure that folks in your sales teams, on your marketing teams, in some of these cases, I'm going to launch a new product. Uh, we're going to get new orders. Therefore, I'm going to put more demand on my supply chain. They'll have to deliver more orders. They have to be prepared for it. So I've got to plan out a lot of these things in detail, right? Or if this was uh, even a digital, completely digital product like Twitter, I'm going to launch a new feature. I expect more users to use it. Uh, someone should have given the infra guys a heads up to say, "Hey, there is going to be more demand for this. Uh, you need to you need to provision more servers." Uh, but if that planning hasn't happened, and, and it's not going to happen easily unless you do this. Kind of careful, well-defined outcomes, right? And of course, align it with your own success. In the Mintra example I gave you, success for us would have been we were seeing new customers that we otherwise wouldn't have gotten into our apps. Success for our customers would have been that the experience is nice enough that they're converting well, right? Now, at a high level, we say, hey, conversion for the entire company is an easy way to say this is working because our core proposition is selling something. But then there are a number of measures under it. Is search uh, CTR looking good? Um, how many products are people viewing? At what rate are they signing up? Which parts of the country are they coming from? But those things like these are not actually the outcomes. Right? Now take that same mobile product and say you are going to revamp the home page, the search page, all of these things and relaunch a new version of it. Right? So it's practically another product. You're replacing your existing product with that. Now your outcomes might be different. You might say, hey, the, the outcome I'm going for is I want to retain the core conversion experience, but I want to make it faster because my existing product, maybe it's not fast enough. Right? Or it's uh, the, the layout is too cluttered and people are confused about what to look at. And therefore, I'm going to simplify it and the outcome is going to be reduced bounce rates. Now, when you do a project like that, what will end up happening is if you start looking at incremental revenue and all of that, you might find that there is no difference. And it's very easy for you to go back and say, hey, this, this thing is a failure because no new customers, I was getting 10 bucks yesterday, I'm still getting 10 bucks today. But the same 10 bucks, if you're getting them from customers who are happier because they have a faster experience, who are sticking on your site longer, who are exploring more products, it will pay off in the long run with repeat rates. Now that part is, partly common sense, partly conviction. You're not going to have an easy way to measure. There's no way for you to say, I'm going to A-B test this by saying 50% of my users are not going to get the benefit of a faster website or better laid out website. Maybe you can A-B test little bits and pieces of it to optimize, but you can't A-B test that whole thing in that manner. And so you will occasionally be stuck with situations where the outcomes are actually more qualitative, right? So this repeat, the belief that customers will repeat is a qualitative thing. But the outcome that you can definitely measure is, did my customers bounce? Because if they did, that means they were having a better experience than they did. And at the end, be really, really very, very careful about making sure it's reflective of what you set out to do in the first place. The most common problem I've seen, and I've seen this in my own products with myself in the past, it's very important to fight this urge of not finding the metric that makes your product look good and assume that's the outcome that says, hey, that was my value find out. Right. So maybe I launched this mobile product and it turns out that I didn't get any new customers, but my existing customers gave me a little more revenue. It's very easy to point to that and say, look, success there, I'm done. Being honest with ourselves and saying the original goal was to acquire new customers, we didn't. 
And if that didn't happen, we either go back to the drawing board, try to figure it out or optimize. What you do, that's a completely different game. But have that honesty because it's very, very easy to get stuck with vanity metrics and believe that your product actually worked. But in this case, probably your hypothesis itself was wrong. It could be. See, and that's why I said, you know, depending on what, what kind of problem you see, you're then going to say, what other data is there? <coughs> so for example, in this particular case, we did end up getting new customers, but imagine, you know, straw man argument, we didn't get enough customers. I go back and look at the people who are showing up. What is their overlap with people who already have the app, right? So at least for the signed in customers, I should be able to do that. Uh, which locations are they coming in from? I know what locations my customers usually come in from. I know that distribution. Is this distribution vastly different from that? Right? Uh, maybe they're coming in and it's not becoming incremental customers because conversion is worse. Maybe the search functionality is not performing as well. Or check out on this new product is not performing as well. You, you'll have to go down into the details. It's, and that's the reason I said at the beginning that it's very tough to prescribe one formula and say, or a, a flowchart and say, when you follow this, your launch will definitely succeed. But if you're true to the original idea that you set out with, then you'll go back and find all these things. So basically what outcomes you define in the beginning is what you measure yeah. after the launch as well. You see whether yeah. you're measuring up to those outcomes. Clearly. Absolutely. The other bit of it is very deliberate planning, right? And when I say deliberate, many people often ask me, that will slow us down. And deliberation doesn't mean slowness. It doesn't automatically mean you spend hours and hours debating something. <laughs> you can make decisions, but it has to be a deliberate decision. If you don't do that, you will default into a decision. So uh, talking about the outcome, so when uh, Infra decided to go from web to mobile, so the, 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 you mean turning off the websites? You mean turning off the website and having only the app, uh, yeah. app based stuff. So what were the desired outcomes? And so um, I wasn't there at that time. I've I've heard many different versions of that story. So in this one, I can only rationalize post hoc as to why I thought it was still a very good move at that time. The one thing it did, and actually I'd seen a very similar thing happen at Twitter as well. Uh, was it actually sensitized the entire company to working on mobile. So before that, the desktop web product was where every employee's head was. Because think about it, like even today, if someone tells me there's a problem with Mithra, the easiest thing I can do is I'm on my laptop throughout the day, I just fire up Mithra.com and I check what's happening there. But the moment the web products kind of went away, the web products went away, it was only mobile apps. Everyone, for engineering it meant um, the skill sets that we had in the company started changing. More and more engineers got trained in developing for mobile. Uh, our uh, engineers became more cognizant of the fact that, yes, on desktop, you take certain things for granted. Typically, more stable internet connections than on phones. You take uh, device resources for granted. Typically, more powerful devices. Uh, though that's beginning to change and change. There's probably more parity now. Um, the other thing that it does is, even the way you market, uh, the way you acquire customers, you think about desktop, you typically don't worry as much about install marketing and all that. Right now, I think we're actually really good at install marketing. Right? Very, very efficient. Uh, some of the most efficient spends in the industry as far as acquiring new install systems. So we're able to weed out bad quality installs very, very easily every time we onboard new marketing partners and all that. I think that institutional knowledge probably definitely helped a lot. As to Original hypothesis, unfortunately I wasn't there and I've heard many different versions of it, so I can't tell you exactly what it was. The example of Twitter that I was talking about was very similar. Twitter at that time, I forget the name of the company now, um, there was a company that was training people on Android and iOS development. And they went out and acquired that company and they made an absolute demand on everyone that we are going to become the best possible app on native apps in both iOS and Android. And I think if you look at Twitter pre-2013 and kind of post-2014, massive difference. Like pre-2013, a lot of third-party apps were typically considered to be the best Twitter app out there, right? Like Tweety, Twitteroid, a number of them. But those two years, Twitter went through this massive change and the way they did that was they cut resources for everything else. They made sure that every engineer was actually programming in either iOS or Android. And some of it was, you may never become a mobile developer yourself, 
could just do it. Sensitize yourself to the reality of working in a native app world. Uh, so it's a little bit of a digression from what the launch bit is, but hopefully that gives you some context. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so coming back to the third thing, right? Deliberate planning. Like I was saying, deliberate doesn't necessarily mean slow. In my mind, the deliberate part is because it makes you careful and it makes you confident. So if I know that I'm launching something, let's make this up, right? Let's say I'm working at uh, in e-commerce and I'm launching a loyalty program. Uh, doing it deliberately means if I'm doing maybe a soft launch, I'm not doing a soft launch because at the last minute I figured out, well, that's the best I can do. I'm doing a soft launch because that was a deliberate strategy that says, we first launch with a small number of people amongst our most loyal customers. Get feedback because there are these three things that we are unsure about. Once we know that those three things are working, then we'll go back, expand into a few more people. And so As opposed to saying, we are absolutely sure about what we're doing. There's going to be a big bang launch. It's this day, the marketing campaign kicks off, product opens up, and it's live to everyone. Right? Two very different strategies. It's very easy to defa default into the latter if your company has a lot of resources and you're not being questioned about your budgets. It's very easy to default into the first if you are actually quite constrained. Whereas maybe, even if you were constrained for resources, a big bang launch is the right answer. And if you're not doing that careful planning, you come all the way to the end, you already spent whatever number of months designing, developing, you know, getting set for release. And then at that point, you're going to lose patience. So a lot of this planning has to keep happening in the background as you come up to the product. Now, the reason why I say launch with confidence is this is your first step in front of the customer with that product. Um, if right after you launch it, I mean, I'm going to pick on an app that has been the part of many jokes. Think about the Kim Ho app, right? Uh, I don't know how many of you looked at it. Apparently, their overarching goal was to build an app that was a super secure messaging system. And that was the one thing they actually failed on. Otherwise, you could debate about many other aspects of it, but it's a, probably a reasonable option for messaging. But they completely failed in their original thing. And they pulled the app down, then they brought it up again, then they brought it down again. And now the thing is, they could launch a third time with everything being perfect. But this is kind of stuck with them. Right? Um, so launching with confidence, the important thing is, if you need to take that little bit of extra time, take that extra bit of time. But make sure you're launching it right. Now there are some places where you might not be able to take that extra bit of time. Right? What do you do when you've got a timed launch where 20 other partners are like? It's very common in the B2B world, right? Because my product is going to go out there and I need to have enough partners on that platform. There, if you suddenly change the timelines, you're changing the timelines for 20 external parties. They're never going to work with you again. Right? They're going to say, look, I put all this hard work, I changed my roadmap because you told me this thing would be out in the market, but it wasn't. Again, you need that deliberate, careful planning. And that's why when I say deliberate planning, a lot of people tell me, oh, that's a B2B thing. Because you've got all these external dependencies, but that's actually not true. In fact, in B2B, this gets forced. If you as a product manager don't do it, the rest of your organization will make you do it. Right? Your partnerships guys will make you do it. So what goes in first? Planning or the deadline? It depends on what your product is, right? So, like I said, there are certain products in which there is truly an external deadline. So I'll give you the example of uh, my first year at Mitra. Um, one of the product managers in my team wanted to launch gift cards. And um, I think this would have been around February or March, around the time I joined. We had a lot of debate about whether we could actually fit it into our roadmap or not. We looked at it and we said, no, we've got other priorities. We can't do this. But it wasn't just we can't do this. We said, not only are we not going to do it, we're not going to do it until next year in roughly June or July. Because the point was, we wanted to launch it with the festive season. Because we knew without that, there is not a lot of visibility. It has to be something like the festive season or the wedding season, where usage will become big enough that when we launch it, we can actually market it. Uh, we can use different channels to push it out there in front of consumers. So if we didn't do it now, we just wait for one full year. And so in that sense, it's not like its deadline comes first or planning comes first. For certain products, the deadline is kind of imposed on you by other factors. Um, 
But in most consumer products, typically most consumer features, you will find that timelines are probably more in your control. If you need to launch a little bit later, you can. So what happens if you put a deadline, but while you're nearing that deadline, you realize that your launch plan has not gone as per plan, and it's definitely going to fail, or most probably going to fail. Yeah. So what do you do? You take the extra time to build it right, or you try to see. This is a tough one. So in a perfect world, you take the extra time, you will <coughs> fix the problems that you've discovered, and then launch. Um, but it's not a perfect world. There are cases, like I said, where if you can't meet that deadline, then you're delayed by an entire year, right? Or even worse, imagine it's a hardware product. You, you're going to be finished because you, you've got manufacturers and suppliers and everyone else dependent on this product launch. So there, actually, the planning goes in much, much, much more deep. And in, the reason why I brought up deliberate planning also is that, especially in the consumer world, a lot of uh, product managers go, well, we do agile, so we don't plan. And then agile is not a substitute for planning. In fact, if anything, um, you plan for the scale, the customer experience, all of this just as carefully with agile as you do anywhere else. Right? Um, and it's not just scale and experience, right? Like I said, iteration. You should have some sense of when this product goes out, what are my what are my possible next iterations going to be? Uh, how much is, uh, you said uh, that you have to launch it right, so how do you say that this is right? Because for me, as a product manager, I would want X number of features to be in, I've tested it out, I'm fine with it, I know yes, this is going to go, but now, yes, I've got initial customer feedback as well, I've done my primary, secondary research, all that stuff, you know, I've got initial customer or I've done a beta, initial customer feedback, as well. still there's that, that <coughs> A little ninety-five percent. Yes, I know that I go five percent is there. You know, so how do I say that is right? You know, see there, some of that you you got to learn to live with, right? Part of being a product manager is as much as we eulogize data, as much as we eulogize all the research that we do. The reality is, a lot of our decisions get made with imperfect data, right? and product launches are like that. You could come to the end and realize, look, in getting here, I've sacrificed three things that were in my original scope. The one thing that you can fall back on is always keep your original objective in mind. And if the things you've sacrificed harm the original objective, then the better call is to delay the launch but bring in those features. But if they were, in your mind, nice to have, uh, then don't worry about it. Right? And that's where you plan deliberately for iteration. You say, look, I'm going to have to go to go to market without having my referral program in place. Right? So I built some consumer app and I wanted to build a referral program as a way of acquiring new users once it starts scaling. But then have a very clear plan for when that's going to go out immediately after. In some ways, it's not like the entire team is going to get caught up in launching a product. Right? There are still people working on the product who continue plugging away. Um, and if you're a very small team, you're like two people, three people, they're still not going to take up all of your time. It's not like you're staring at the dashboard all day saying, I've launched it now, I need to look at it all day. You're going to look at it at particular intervals. But you need to have a plan for what is that next iteration going to be. Be prepared for customer misbehavior. Right? Yes, primary research and secondary research will indicate something, but your customers might use the product in a completely different way. They, they could end up choosing to use your product in very, very different ways than you had imagined. Now, sometimes you can take advantage of it and actually build a completely different kind of product there. Or sometimes you have to cut your losses and say, hey, actually, I didn't realize something like this would be done so differently by me. I can't talk a lot about it today, but hopefully over the course of the next few weeks or months as I interact with you guys in different forums here, I might be able to come back and tell you a very interesting story that we're working through right now. we we launched something and we've observed that people are using it, but just not the way we are expecting them to use it. And so now we are actually trying to figure out oh, if that is what they really want to do with it, what's the product that can come out? Um, and if we don't discover one, yes, we'll kill it. But if we do discover one, then there is actually an interesting new product to be but Don't forget your competitors, don't forget regulation, depending on what sector you are in. Uh, especially in India, this is quite relevant because a lot of the stuff that we are doing is in areas where regulation is still developing, right? Uh, think about privacy regulation. Uh, the good thing though is I wouldn't, like, 
lose sleep over this because this hurts everyone in the market equally, it helps everyone in the market. So be prepared for it because it might change the nature of the iterations you do. You might have to suddenly say, I can't launch that referral program because I have to do this other compliance thing and I'll do it. Uh, whereas somebody who's already got a referral program might continue scaling it during that. So you don't base your life on regulatory action or regulatory changes and all of that. Uh, because it's a level playing field for everyone, but on the other hand, remember this will always suck away time. Uh, it will always suck away time from things that you could be doing. So good product launches, like I said, they're just the beginning, not the end. They have well-defined outcomes. They're deliberate. If I look at bad product launches, most common things I see are deployed, jobs done. Product manager walks away, engineering manager walks away. Um, they're working on their next feature. And they're not actually the people who are sitting there and saying, this thing has launched, is it working? If it's not working, what do we do about it? And even if it is working well, could we actually get more out of it because it's working? That's actually still the job of the product management, right? So it's, this is very, very common because product managers, especially in uh, the software world, work so closely with their engineering managers, with their program managers, but many times they see the completion of the development of that software as the job being done. Right? And uh, Sai is here, and I'm sure especially even outside the consumer world, in a world like Oracle, in point that you, the development of the software being done is probably the beginning of the next mountain to climb. Yeah, I have interesting stories to share. <laughs> so in the consumer world, at least many times, usually after the deployment is done, it's out there in front of the users, a lot of stuff starts moving fast. In the B2B world, there's still a lot of work to be done. Because your customers are not just people who just want to come sign up and start using the product. You want to go market the product. You want to go build partnerships. You want to revisit things like your pricing. The second thing is we'll measure what we can. Um, and like I said, unless you're very, very deliberate and careful about what your original objective was, you'll just pick the first thing that looks good, that vanity metric, put it in front of the CEO and say, look, fantastic product uh, launch. And finally, the we are agile, therefore we don't plan a lot ahead. Yes, it's true, but being agile doesn't mean you don't plan for how your launch is going to go. You're doing detailed planning of the work that you're going to do in the next week. It's two weeks, or maybe for someone it's four weeks. But there's a you know kind of time timeline that you define, saying for this time period, I'm going to define everything in detail ahead of that timeline. Then finish this and then describe the details for the rest. But even there, you've still got a vision of what you're building. It's not like you don't have. And, and that, that in fact is one of the things that I find very, very annoying when people tell me we're agile and you're asking us to plan and that's not agile. Tell them two very, very different things. So some practical tips. One, communication. And this is a big bugbear for me because a lot of people write the right documentations but don't share them by name. The product is not going to get launched by you alone. You're just a product manager. You need marketing managers, you need people in your sales teams, people in your service teams, people, depending on what kind of product it is, it could be people from across the entire company, right? Like I was giving that example, I could launch a product, not tell my supply chain guys that they're going to get hit with a bunch of orders, and then find the warehouse is choked. And not only have I hurt these customers, I've hurt the rest of my customers as well. Or I did tell the customer service guys that look, there is a there is a certain chance that you'll get flooded with phone calls because if something goes wrong here, you're going to get a lot of phone calls. Right? It could be as simple as I've changed the design of the contactors page and maybe the phone number is now much easier and more prominent than say an option like chat or self service, and so the calls go up. And if they don't have any preparation for it, uh, you're going to hurt the rest of your customers as well. So sharing, one, making them share things that everybody's on the same page. And again, when I say share, it's not enough to just say, share with this person on Google Docs or send it to them as an email. I highly recommend pull people together, get them to sit down, talk through it, get them to write their portion of the document as well. Right? So when I write a product document and I say, this is the launch plan for something, I actually leave placeholders in there for customer service, for supply chain and others and say, please write this out. Because when they write it out, it's based on their understanding of the product. And if there's a mismatch between us, we'll figure it out. 
Whereas if I say, just tell me and I'll fill it out. I'm going to hear what I want to hear and I'm going to finish. We're all supposed to be good listeners as product managers, but believe me, there is a limit to all of our capacities. Uh, the second thing is make it written, not verbal. It's very, very common that a lot of misunderstandings that we see happen because people say, well, you said you were going to do this, or this person said on that call, or this was agreed three weeks ago. Make it written not because you don't trust people, but because it's a simple way for us to make sure that there is a believable log, there's a trustworthy log of the decisions. That we have. And the last bit is precision. And I think this is where we let ourselves down many, many times because we just write however we want. Um, I don't know how many of you had the pleasure or the displeasure of having to write uh, scientific papers or something like that at any point in your life. Uh, but your professor would have given you a very hard time before anything got published, right? Like, I remember we went from, I would say, zero to, I don't know, 90, maybe in three weeks. Like, we finished all the work that we were doing on this uh, bit of research when I was in grad school. We got everything out there. The last 10, though, it took us nearly three months of going back and forth with that professor. Then we all got it right, we submitted it. Then referees came back telling us, this is not quite well worded and all that. One of the things that it did teach me is being very precise about what you need. Because once you get that part right, most of the other bits are largely form or you know, syntax. In many of our documents, we can get away with minor uh, you know, transgressions there. But if precision is absent, then we're going to do hand wavy things like saying, uh, for dormant customers, we'll do this. But we've never defined anywhere in our documentation what dormant customers are. Like who do we treat as dormant? Someone who's not transacted for three months, six months, one year. They maybe visited the site, but would you count that as dormant or not? Defining those things precisely helps because then when you start measuring, uh, you figure out what kind of report you're going to set up. In fact, one of my favorite, um, I'll, I'll give this away, product management interview questions is I actually ask people, here's a product feature. Uh, Literally, using the whiteboard, draw me a dashboard of what you would look at if you're the product manager. And then I ask them to define most of the metrics that they put out. And I'll tell you, it's surprising how many people actually struggle to define some of the metrics because they hear the metric and they think one thing, but when they start writing it down, it strikes them how hard it is to define some of those things. Um, it's an example like uh, someone was trying to tell me about uh, searches. They said, the number of refinements that have been applied to a search will tell me, you know, what was, uh, how good their experience was. I said, how do you define a refinement? They said, well, they had a search for red shoes, but then they had it for red running shoes. That's a refinement. Okay. As you are a software engineer, what would you tell me to write? What code do I write to know that red shoes to red running shoes is a modified query? But what if they were crimson shoes? Will it be modified? Will it not be modified? Um, and what if they truly wanted to modify it on their own? Once, let's say, you did figure out how many refinements are there. Are some refinements better than the others? Are they worse than the others? How do you figure that out? Trying to answer those kind of questions. Many, and fortunately, most of you have engineering backgrounds. Try to answer it like an engineer. How would that number show up on a screen? Write the formula for it. Maybe you don't know how to write the code for it because it's in systems or uh, languages that you're not familiar with, but write the pseudocode for it. And if you can't write it, believe me, your engineers can't either. Right? Because a lot of reporting is not about rocket science. A lot of reporting is taking data that's there, manipulating it, reshaping it, aggregating it, and presenting it somewhere. And most of us have that skill. If we can't do it, I think assuming that, well, my, I have like really smart engineers, it's not going to help because we give them a vague definition. They can't do it either. Measurement. Make sure it's agreed. Right? So like I said, agree on the definitions. Make sure it's set up before you launch. The other most common problem I've seen many times, um, I've seen this in companies I've worked in, I've seen this in other places that I've gone and spoken to people, have friends, have consulted with, etc. Most people just assume, look, I have a limited amount of time. I've already had to cut a couple of features. So what I'm going to do is launch this with only bare minimum instrumentation. And then after it's launched, I'll add the rest of the instrumentation and set up my reports. 
We find it very easy to sacrifice that because the user doesn't see that. But, the, but that's probably one of the biggest things that's going to teach you about what your users think about your product. And so you basically want to launch it blind. So make sure it's absolutely set up and it's tested. That's the other place where we cut corners. You know what I'm saying? We've tested the feature, we're running short, we absolutely have to launch. It's okay, you know, how long can data go? And then you launch it and you realize that you're double counting users or you're entirely dropping users from one browser or from certain kinds of devices. Uh, we have like this very interesting problem that we discovered um, about five months ago where uh, we found that a lot of our analytics data was suddenly beginning to drop. And well, you know, you know we had this uh, server that we used to hit every time with a certain payload which would then get processed as an analytics. And the success rate there started dropping from what used to be like 99.99 something to 75, like very, very rapidly. <laughs> Spent a couple of days looking at it and we couldn't figure out what was happening. Finally figured out it was only happening with Geo. So apparently Geo was doing something to HTTP packets. And there were some, I think, on the Android version of the app, we hadn't switched that over to HTTP as on iOS we had. Um, the next version of the Android app that went out had also switched everything to HTTP as and the problem seemed to go away. And it kept getting smaller every day as people went from the older versions of the app to the newer versions of the app. But finally the engineer was kind of going behind this, figured out that the problem was HTTP packets were getting launched uh, for some reason the Geo. We got that sorted out, but the reason I bring that up is it's a very obscure problem, but that's 25% of the user base. Now fortunately for us here, this was for a running thing in production. So the problem happened, we figured it out, we fixed it, we moved on. But imagine this was for a product that was just being launched. If we had not tested our analytics pipeline end to end, they just gone, yeah, everything's going to work. And then when we launch, we would have said, we have 75 users, when in reality we have 100. Um, we wouldn't have had behavior of an entire set of users on one telco provider, um, who also has users who probably have very different behavior from others. And so, Testing this, it's actually painful, it's time consuming, but it's completely worth it. And then user feedback. Be prepared by the time you launch for how you're going to collect it. Right? So for example, if you're going to bring in people for usability research, make sure that your user research team's already got the folks set up to uh, recruit the people, bring them in, it, it's an incentivized program or there's some kind of honorarium you're giving them, make sure those budgets are in place, get that all sorted out. If there is user feedback that you're collecting through surveys, make sure those surveys have already been defined. The questions are not being debated at the last moment, instead they're all ready to go. Uh, if the user feedback is coming in through uh, your Play Store, App Store, reviews and all of that, have something that lets you collect all of that. Right? So the Play Store, for example, gives you APIs to pull all of that up. The App Store doesn't, but there are other third-party tools you use to pull them in. And then decide what are you going to do with them. Are you going to run some NLP on them, figure it out? Are you going to build a word cloud? Don't do that at the last moment. Right? If you have that ready, then right from day one, at the end of each day, you should be able to produce a report on your user. For me, these are three big things that actually helped me go from being one of those default product launch guys to being actually confident about the product launch. And still, we, we get a lot of things wrong at times. Right? We're, for example, in Mitra, we're trying to move fast on a number of things. Uh, when you move fast, you make mistakes. But the good thing is because we have a good framework around this, it's easy to recover from those mistakes. I learned this bit first when um, I technically wasn't a product manager. I was working at Norfolk Southern. Uh, it's a railroad company. And I used to be an operations researcher there. We built some um, algorithms for uh, fleet management. So these are the guys who are trying to figure out how many rail cars should we buy or lease. And these are not cheap decisions, right? Very big capital intensive uh, problems. And so we did the simulation software, built it all out, built a nice front end for it. And then one day I did that bit, right? Launched, done. And uh, I kind of inherited this project because my boss left midway to go off and uh, become a professor in university again. 
And so I was just called in and told, take the song and sing it through to the end. I thought I'd saw, seen it through to the end. And sure, you know, maybe two weeks later, uh, this Sri Lankan boss, Ajit, calls me and he says, So, how is uh, strategic fleet planning going? Yes, it would be going okay. We launched it, I haven't heard any complaints. So, no, okay, fine. Later in the day, he calls me back and he says, uh, You tell me you haven't heard any complaints, is anybody using this damn thing? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I thought my job was to launch the software, I've launched it. And I got my first proper lesson in go back, sort this out. And it was also a lesson in trying to understand internal change, right? We were asking people who used to do this on Excel spreadsheets or however they used to do it to start using a different kind of software. They didn't know what was inside. It took me the better part of nearly six months to get to the point where I could say this was launched. Because I had to go sit down with these people, understand how they did their planning, <coughs> convince them that this model of planning was actually superior, the simulation would give them useful stuff. There was a little bit of pain they had to put up with entering data into our software as opposed to playing around with them Excel, which is still more efficient and faster for them. The value they're getting out of it is better. And I was doing all of this in a domain where I had very little authority. I was not a railroad expert. I was a Operations research graduate with less than a year's experience at that time. But those six months actually taught me how important it was to have sorted out all of this. Because I've interned, the first thing I actually said to one of the transportation managers was, We spoke about this six weeks ago, and you said you launch it and we'll use it. And we launched it and you didn't use it. It was like, Oh, you know, we could say we'll use it, but we never agreed on exactly what criteria had to be met for us to use it. And this was an internal product. Right? I have access to these users. I can go talk to them. Push comes to shove. I'm pretty sure if I didn't do my job well, our VP would have cracked the whip and made them just use the software. This was the reason the company put that investment. In. They believed this method was better. This was having that kind of access. It took me that amount of time to kind of recover from this mistake. But now imagine you're launching to the public. You can't just go and badge it. You're going to like, I'm going to talk about it. You can't say that. Um, so working on this bit really makes a huge, huge, huge difference. So that brings me to the end. Um, I did want to say thanks for being so patient. Uh, I know it's the end of a long day, uh, but hopefully there's some stuff you enjoy. Happy to take any questions, whether they're about specific products, <laughs> launches, or things that you want to know about. So, so a quick one of the measurements. So uh, one is the measurements of the customer behavior, but do you uh, have measurements related back into saying that, okay, this is the customer behavior measurements, but then it relates into uh, the software metrics, it goes into the uh, different different kinds of metrics which are chained towards the customer behavior metrics, which is See, yeah, I level level the, as well. The, the two things that I would worry the most about would be one, making sure we're measuring the outcome correctly. So whatever that outcome is. And the second thing is the leading indicators for that outcome. So sometimes what might happen is if the outcome is something like retention, I might not see the impact until some time has passed, right? But there might be some leading indicators. Maybe those customers are using the product more uh, frequently. They're using it more intensively. Um, or that they're beginning to use more features within a product where they're only using a handful of features. Only. These are all indicators that Retention is likely to improve. But depending on your product, you'd actually work back and say, what are those few things that I want to measure? Now, if it cascades down, I'm sure there are engineers who'd be looking at API response times and uptime and availability and stuff like that. There would be, uh, say, people on customer service would be talking about, would be looking at the rate of inbound calls, number of complaints they're getting, uh, how long it's taking them to resolve some of these things. Uh, so everybody will come up with their own metrics for this and that's where that shared communication helps, right? Because the moment you say, this is all that I'm going to affect, everybody then starts planning and you, know, you generally give everyone the benefit of the doubt and trust that they'll do the right thing. They know what to do for their function. Uh, so yes, shorter answer is, yes, everybody else also tracks a number of metrics. As a PM though, I worry about the outcomes and any leading indicators that tell me about the outcome if it's not an immediate. How do you take care of partial launches? Say it's not a full product per se, it's a group of features. Yeah. 
Your product the same way. But the features should have some outcome attached. Okay, but then uh, key metrics like okay. is it helping me retain? Is it helping me get new customers? How so let's let's take a concrete them? example, right? Um, on Mintra, we have a search functionality, um, and let's say someone's come up with a smarter auto suggest. Now I have to sit down and say, well, when you say smarter, what's smarter about it? This guy told you one of the things it does is it remembers the context of the session and it prioritizes things that are related to what they've recently searched, recently browsed, up higher in auto suggest. So what this would mean is the outcome should be one that sorry faster to find. Yeah, so you should, yeah, people should be able to find the product they want faster. Right? And so then you say, okay. Precisely, if I wanted to measure it, how would I do it? Mm -hmm. okay. From the point that they start searching, how many actions does it take them to actually get to add a product to cart? Are they able to find the right product? Okay. And if they're not able to find the right product, then at least in the Mintra context, we didn't serve them well enough. And the slight variant of that is they could have added to cart or they could have added to their wish list. Yeah. Either way, it's fine. Yeah. Well, it tells me that they've got interest in something and they've sorted it. Uh, so now this is just a specific feature inside another feature, but each one of them will have a value. And incidentally, for auto suggest, we also look at the rate at which auto suggestions are accepted. That's the leading indicator for us. That maybe this behavior doesn't set in until people start realizing that the auto suggest is good and they can trust it. But let's say earlier, out of every hundred times that I showed an auto suggest, um, ninety times it was being accepted. But after I released this, it dropped to eighty. There will be something, something wrong. On the other hand, it stayed at 90 or it went up. That's actually true. Okay. Sorry, you look at one I come from a success background and um, we generally have a lot of these program managers. I mean, I've been involved in some of them where we, from an optimization standpoint, we look at uh, some profitable accounts on this one. So, uh, I mean, uh, so we, Basically, go down even closing down a lot of those programs or accounts yeah. at certain times. So, for our product uh, engineering, when we come down, what are the metrics that you or a combination of metrics that you normally see to probably start discontinuing a feature or a product or a domain within Mitra or similar? And so, who takes that decision and how often? See, in my mind, the, the how often bit is actually easy to answer. It's more of a continuous process. Because, um, let me think of a good example of two variants of this, right? Um, when I was at House Trip, uh, it was a vacation rental marketplace. So, what that meant is you could list your home uh, as a vacation rental, and on the other side, we had demand. People who wanted to go on holiday could find and book your home. We specifically focused on the European market. We did do anything special for the Asian or American markets in the sense that our payouts in those currencies were not supported. We only paid out in euros or Swiss francs um, or British pounds. Uh, we, um, in fact, even US dollars we started quite late. We did a lot of uh, optimization for figuring out location and addresses that we specialized to Europe, but if those use cases didn't work in Asia or somewhere else, we just didn't bother. Now we still used to get both on the supply and demand side some stuff going on there. <coughs> the demand from Asia that came for European properties was part of our core business. But anybody who complain about Asian businesses, our general approach was if it was a situation where a customer could get badly hurt or a supplier could get badly hurt, and badly hurt doesn't necessarily mean any kind of physical danger, but it could be they lose their money or they have a terrible experience or whatever. If it is a situation like that, we completely cut it off. Right? So, for example, if I allow somebody from India to sign up, and the only way I can pay them is using uh, a European bank account, and for them to receive the payment, they need certain sort of paperwork in place, and if they don't have that, they're going to get in trouble with tax authorities. That would be a terrible thing for me to do to keep the platform open. Sort of. So, in those kind of situations, we close off certain markets, and this was kind of a easy decision. The more difficult decision for us was um, when we were working on uh, shared rentals. So this was slightly the Airbnb model, right? You don't rent the entire house, which was our primary business. 
but you share a portion of the house. Uh, it was great, it was growing in volume, but profitability wise, it was actually very poor. Because small units, the turnarounds are higher, it only works for those guys if there's a high commission and all of that. The way we, went, we ended up taking that decision was we said, look, we have a certain amount of capacity to work on problems. Um, we we'll put all of that into solving the problem of whole vacation home rentals for families. Because families are the ones that we found had the highest uh, kind of delight in using this product relative to most other groups that we could have. And so once we figured out that, let's say we took that out, yes, our booking numbers would look smaller. We probably lose like 40% of bookings. But in revenue terms, we probably lost something like 80%. Um, in profitability terms, it actually didn't hurt us. Our average profitability actually um, in terms of customer complaints, we got a lot fewer because it's the shared homes where we used to get more complaints than the old homes. Entire homes typically tend to be more professionally managed than someone who's renting out one room in their house where they also begin it a little bit. Um, so we looked at all of those metrics to make that decision. So I don't think there's a like a simple formula, but it's much like you do in services. Every few months, every year, rank different aspects of your business and figure out is it time to start doing something or is it time to stop doing something. And on Mintra, for example, we continuously turn off suppliers who are not performing. That's an ongoing thing. Every week, there's someone who looks at this data and says this supplier's turnaround times are getting really bad. Therefore, we're not able to deliver the customers on time. Let's do this with them. There's also a good strategic reasons why Sorry? <coughs> strategic reasons why you shut down. Yeah, there could, there could also be very strategic reasons why you shut down. So is there, is there a specialist product manager out there or a specific role or a product manager generally also takes care no. of that? So my general view is that look, very rarely on the consumer side have I found domain specialist product managers to make massive difference. On the B2B side, yes, definitely. Right? Because the level of involvement you have with your customers and their business is very, very different. So when I used to work in ads, I used to spend a lot of time trying to understand how ad agencies would work, how advertisers uh, and their marketing teams would work. Uh, but on the consumer side, what I found is that consumer attitudes are changing really fast. The technology they're using is changing yeah. using is changing really fast. So what I knew about e-commerce five years ago, many parts of it are outdated. Like, there is an entire set of businesses being built around renting clothes. Maybe most of us sitting around this room to go, who's going to rent clothes? But I, I at least have the feeling that in a few years, we're probably going to find those being relatively large, viable businesses. Right? And there are already a few small ones that are beginning to do well there. Right? Guys like Fido, um, a renter of the in the US and others. Um, so I think, Rather than looking for a specialist, look at the outcome and let a generalist keep chasing it because the criteria are going to change. Now, of course, if you're in B2B, maybe domain expertise matters. Even on the consumer side, I would say uh, folks who work on our supply chain products, uh, domain expertise matters. I would rather give my warehouse management side of the world to someone who's actually. But I meant specialist more of the management specialist. Oh, okay. It's like more the interaction. When you're closing down things because you don't want to go up to the oh, So see, here's the thing, right? One, One of the, the negative things. feedback to many other businesses yeah. right? because they are closed down or something. So on that, the way to think about it is as a PM, you will probably be the person building the framework for those decisions, but the decision for that should lie with the business owner of that function. So for example, this listing of vendors is done by the category teams, the category management teams at the Product managers would have helped them build the tool or the report or whatever it is that helps them identify these things. Yeah. To help them arrive at the decision, to help them manage that decision. And maybe that causes then a bunch of workflow to manage all of that. But the PMs shouldn't be the ones. The person who should be doing it is the person who owns that process. So specifically around product management, when Mintra runs these end of reason say oh yeah right one more coming what up. yeah exactly so <laughs> what is the specific role of product management because your entire organization is focused on that sale yeah. and i heard folks working night and day to make it happen right so yeah. what is the role of product management there um threefold the first part is 
we usually use end of season sales as a way to introduce new features as well. Um, the second thing is um, the scale of that whole thing is so crazy that our product cannot run as is. So I remember the first QRs that I was involved in, which was June 2016. Um, the first three minutes, the demand that we saw was 200 times our usual demand. There's no amount of, you know, setting up more hardware or anything else that would help us deal with that spike. Um, so we actually took the decision of turning off certain features so that we could keep up with that. Now, that is a product decision. I've got search. Which features in search do I turn off? I'm not sure the rank part of them by computational intensity, like how intensively they you know, take up CPU resources or something else and mm -hmm. say, this is the most expensive search feature to run, take it off. It might well be, but I'd maybe be willing to sacrifice four other features and keep this on because this is the most useful thing for a customer. Is that a decision of the product management or the business line saying, okay, so we are okay with it? The product manager will drive that decision. Of course, they'll take all these teams into confidence. Okay. Take the inputs as well. See, because like I said, many product managers, and definitely I have been right, so almost all of them are generalists, right? so smart generalists. They can probably come back with a lot of the business rationale for these things as well. But they usually engage someone from a particular business function to say, help me model this out and validate the model that I have. Uh, now, to the question of is the user going to be happier with this configuration or that configuration, the product manager probably has a lot more say in that right? because they are the people working on user feedback, understanding the user requirements, uh, they are the people who are sitting down with our UX research teams understanding the outcomes of the research that they have done. So usually the voice of the customer bit, they are the authority. The business impact, the authority would probably be someone from our revenue mm -hmm. management teams. And they'll put those two things together to decide what stays on or off. And of course, there's also a technical impact, right? You could yeah. have engineers saying that, look, the risk of keeping certain features on is very high. The product manager does play that balancing role of taking all of this into account and saying how much risk can be lived with. Now, we also introduce features to mitigate that 200x peak. Now that peak is nowhere close to that. Because we actually give early access to our most loyal customers. They're the people who rush in to place those orders at midnight. And certainly they also end up having a better experience because they can shop with less pressure. So that was again a product. The last bit where the product managers play a role is a little bit of being a jack of all hands in some ways um, or a jack of all trades. For a PM means that on the fly if you're trying to make decisions when something is not quite going right or you want to play around with configurations, they're actually very, very useful people in person. So most of the PMs end up staying through the night mm -hmm. on that first night of the sale because let's say the customer demand that we saw in the first few minutes it started tapering off. There's a judgment call to be made. Hey, now maybe the load is low enough that we could turn on some of these features. Those decisions usually a lot of the PMs will make the right time. So while we're talking about teams and, and skills, uh, one question that comes to my mind is if uh, so if you're building say a team with cross domain skills, how would you use a probability as sales guy as a product manager in your team? See, think about go back to thinking about the uh, function of the product manager, right? First job, uh, discover and validate products. So if this person knows enough about that user space, that market space, and this could very well happen, right? Maybe you're a Salesperson has been interacting with the customers for such a long time, they have a deep understanding of what the customers want, and therefore discovering and validating ideas that are coming up might actually turn out to be one of your strong suits. The second thing is uh, having figured that out, defining a good product. Right? This is the part where I think it's not a are you sales, are you not sales, are you engineering or something else. It's something where you should be good at being willing to make decisions around saying this is the scope of a well-defined, self-contained product or feature that will solve one of those problems I've identified before. Uh, it does require some technical skill, especially if the product you're building is a software product. Uh, because how expensive it is to build, how easy it is to build, um, there are a bunch of 
good practices in designing user interfaces. All of these are things that I would expect my PMs to be cognizant of. So if there is a good salesperson who hasn't had exposure to that, I would ask them to actually get exposure to that. Maybe they do a second in product management. Or they work closely with the product manager in building a new feature and get that exposure. Uh, and an intervention like this works? <clears throat> yeah. Why not? It's, it's, a, it's the closest thing you can get yeah. to yeah. having a yeah. second yeah. or a real practical experience. Because yeah. right. you force yourself to figure out what bits you don't know and then you either learn it or you figure out whom to lean on to get that expertise. Mm -hmm. I think that is the idea of the product that Right. Yeah. It basically yeah. exposes uh, the various the things that are involved in building the product. And you can guess why I asked you this question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the third thing is, once you've done these two things, right, you've discovered validated the ideas, you've defined the product well, now get it built and out in the hands of the user as, well. as fast as possible. Right? And reduce the time to, to validate that idea in the hands of the users. That part, again, I think not the deepest technical skill is required, but be good at working with your engineers, your designers, so that if you're making trade-offs in scope, you're making trade-offs in quality, you kind of know how to make this great. So uh, I'm one of the happy customer, Mitra customer for a long time. Just want to know, as we're talking about the design and branding and the customer segment, how you are making the segments or the product segments? Uh, like you say that is men, women, kids, boys, girls. It looks simpler and it's uh, easy for us to work on. But the market segment, something like the baby stores, or the uh, mom and uh, mom and pregnant women stores. Why those kinds of uh, uh, stuff are uh, specialized market has not been focused on, not been shown, especially in the home page or something like that. In the this is a question of how many things you do at once. Uh, so it's just a question of focus. Is it a real estate problem or is it a really you don't see that there is no... Uh, so I don't see it as a real estate problem. Maybe it's a real estate problem at some level but that's solvable. Right? If you can do personalization better, then very quickly you know that for one person you can show that because it's highly relevant to them and for another person you can show it differently. So I think there is tech, there is data, there are algorithms to sort that part out. So I don't think it's a real estate problem. Mm -hmm. But if I'm going to build a good proposition for... Um, I don't know, baby care or yeah. or pregnant women or for whatever definition you come up with, then I should be prepared to spend a significant amount of time understanding why those people have special needs in buying apparel and accessories that my existing product doesn't solve. Uh, maybe all I need to do is make sure search is good enough so they can find exactly the right product. Uh, but it doesn't stop with that, right? These are physical products. I need to now have a category manager who goes and sources the right selection. It's At the end of the day, you could very easily start stretching from saying, when well, you said democratize access to fashion and lifestyle, lifestyle includes sporting goods as well. We sell, we sell sports shoes. Yeah. We occasionally, when there are big sporting events going on, uh, sell a few sporting goods. Um, they generally tend to be co-branded by the major apparel guys, right? Like, so there might be Adidas footballs being sold during the World Cup. But that's a passing thing and the person who's dealing with the Adidas account knows how to make that bit happen. But if I have to be a good football seller, I need to know all of the footballs that are being sold in the country, figure out what to stock out of that, how to catalog them, how to show them. So I think it's not just a can I take my existing selection and put a banner up there? It's a do I have the right selection in the service behind it? So on the how we have time? Uh, let's just okay. take one last okay. Okay. last question. You, you guys have another class after this, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yes, we, we can go on. I mean, uh, in another context, but uh, I don't know if that class is still there. It's it's just just class, so we can check. Yeah, yeah. If he, he said he had to leave, but uh, he let's didn't check it. Okay, yeah. let's, let's go ahead with one last. Make it on so, so, so with all the new yeah. features coming in, there is a conflict and the required request for space on the app created as a fold. So what are the three main factors you look to prioritize a new feature over some of the old features? So, um, in some ways the answer is slightly easy for us. So on a regular day, when we are only merchandising, um, it's a little bit revenue per impression. 
we try to predict for every banner we put up there what is the predicted revenue per impression and whatever has higher revenue per impression goes higher. Um, in fact, we kind of think of our homepage as an ad engine. So internally we developed it as an ad platform. And there is virtual currency allocated to all the different categories and they choose to burn that currency in different ways. Um, but there are a couple of special cases where we have a new feature could be showing up, yeah. like you said. Um, that would just be a policy question of saying we'll al allocate some virtual currency to it. Um, so that whoever owns that feature, it could be a product manager, it could be a category manager, a revenue manager, uh, they can get that enough of uh, visibility. The third kind of situation would be that we're doing a big marketing push for something, maybe a new brand launch or something else. In those cases, we actually stick it right up on top. So a few days ago you have noticed Gap was probably shown to everyone because we made a decision that we are launching the brand on Mintra for the first time. So we want to make sure everybody sees it and is aware of it. And their revenue per impression was not the important thing, it was just the awareness. I mean, you don't want to buy any Gap merchandise today, but as long as you know that Mintra has it wherever you want to, you might remember that we have it. And therefore, we would target it only to specific individuals. So the amount of time that banner is put up is again dependent upon the virtual currency or some other kind? So, two things largely though, there's a very detailed thing and I'm happy to share at least some of the details with you. One is currency, yes you could run out of budget and therefore you're uh, not being shown. Or it could be that uh, for a new feature for example, we, could, we do impression capping. We say don't promote this feature to a user more than three times in a week. And therefore, there might be budget, but I might still not show it. The second kind of thing is it's a time proposition. I might say from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. tonight, I'm going to run a special sale on shoes. In which case, during that period, it's up. I might have allocated a little more virtual currency, maybe it didn't burn all that currency. But by then, it will stop showing up because the proposition doesn't exist. Thank you. Okay. Um, you guys have another class, so it's yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sharad, for uh, the yeah. amazing perspective. I think there are a lot of questions we can go on. Um, yeah. There are a lot of questions that are very real and very relevant, even from an enterprise context, but the approaches are very different, uh, yeah. which is fascinating to me and great learning experience. So, one thing I wanted to really announce, uh, and before that, I wanted to check if Meet remembers my name. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, there's a joke now. <laughs> Any case, um, so I'm happy to announce that uh, Sharath is going to be one of uh, your coaches. So now, you know, you know what questions to ask and what type of, uh, you know, he can bring his wealth of experience and expertise into this. So thank you, Sharad. And so we are Thanks. Thanks we are taking auction dollars now. So did you did you guys receive the team formations and everything yet? Or, uh, no. not yes. yet? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. that should go out probably tomorrow or the after uh, the the uh, you, you form teams. Yes. 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 Yeah. yeah. Yes. That notification along with uh, uh, post pairing also, I believe. So, and uh, once we all publish the availability, Rahul, myself, and Sharad, um, feel free to schedule and I think we should have a good conversation then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.